video this. Saiza Cruz Bakani is a Filipina street and documentary photographer based in Hong Kong. Having worked as a second generation migrant domestic worker in the city, she used photography to raise awareness about underreported stories, focusing on the intersections of labor and human rights. She is one of the Magnum Foundation Photography and Social Justice Fellows of 2015. She has exhibited worldwide, won awards in photography, and is the recipient of a resolution passed by the Philippines House of Representatives in her honor, HR number 1969. Saiza is a WMA Commission grantee, a Pulitzer Center and Open Society Foundation Moving Walls 27 grantee. She is one of BBC's 100 Women of the World 2015, 30 Under 30 Women Photographers 2016, Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia 2016, Asia Society's 21 Young Leaders 2018, and a Fuji Film Ambassador. She's also the author of the book, We Are Like Air. And today, Saiza shares with us her experiences on the front line, what she witnessed herself um, photographing um, nurses and um, medical workers in not just in Metro Manila, but in rural hospitals around the country. Um, and she will also share her own learnings from, from her experience. Thank you, Saiza. Thanks, Lombina, for that very nice introduction. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm very excited when Lombina asked me to do a presentation. Um, so Bambina and I have known each other for three years now, no? So I think it was three years since we've met. Anyway, I, I wanna start with um, a presentation about I'm not sure if you're seeing this, but uh, say yes, if you see this. So um, the title of this work personally for me is called The Unseen Frontliner. So let me start with uh, in January, I was in Hong Kong and I came back to Manila uh, on January 25 for an assignment. But even before that, people are already talking about coronavirus back then it's still called coronavirus uh, on dinner at dinner uh, conversations in Hong Kong so when I went back home I, uh, in the in Manila when I went back to Manila I thought I was just gonna be in Manila for a few days but then I decided to went back home to the province to celebrate my, to celebrate my birthday and then unluckily um, it was announced as a pandemic so Flights were canceled. CDC started started to close the border, so I decided to stay back home. And this project is actually very personal for me as well because I grew up in Bambang, Navabiskaya. It's a it's a small town, eight hours from Manila, so the closest airport is six hours away. But uh, I've never really looked at this town the way I have experienced other cities that I photograph. So when I found out that our nurses are actually uh, on the front line without benefits, I started to dig deeper and understand how these frontliners are actually saving lives and ris saving lives while risking their own without benefits. So. I will start with this photo. Personally, you know, like hospital personals in Manila. When you say hospital personals, they are the frontliners, no? But in rural areas like my province, hospital personals are strictly speaking our last line of defense. It is the health personals on community level, which are the gatekeepers, the ones who are the real frontliners, because they are the ones who are stopping our hospitals from being overwhelmed with patients. So in, our, uh, in a lot of rural areas around the country, rural health units are essential part of the Philippines healthcare system. It is the prim primary source of healthcare for the community on a grassroots level. It is also, they are also the ones who are providing immunization, dissemination of information, and um, a lot of um, community health checkups for people who cannot afford to go to private doctors. So these first photo are masks that are being used by our nurses here in the province. These are cloth masks while going, and they wash it over and over again while going out to check up 
uh, possible cases of COVID-19. I mean, the, the personal, the PPE should be N95s, med medical grade N95s, medical grade PPEs, but because of lack of PPEs, they are forced to use cloth masks, which we all know are not enough protection, especially when they are in contact with suspected case of COVID-19. So the second photo, this is our only public doctor out of 53,000 people. So I say public because he's the one responsible for that big population of this is small town. It's 53,000 and then one doctor. So we have other doctors that they practice privately, but we, uh, Dr. Cortez is the only one who's running the rural health unit and is responsible for most of the population. So he, in this photo, he's showing this, um, this face covers that they created, that they innovated because as he have said, it's either this or nothing. And he, he'd feel better, better if the nurses and him is at least using this um, makeshift face, face shields that they created. And then I want to introduce you to April Abrias, uh, midwife. So it's not only nurses who are like working together to combat COVID-19 in rural areas, even the midwives who are, yes, they are medically trained, but they're not supposed to be handling COVID patients, but because it, we are understaffed, even midwives are now going out to check possible cases of COVID-19. So this is April Abrias who walks miles every day to check on, you know, to check up on patients. So the setup is in every barrio, in every village, a nurse or a midwife is assigned to look after that population. So with April, she's looking after 4,000 people. And so every day, because there's, when the lockdown happened, there are no public transportation, she was forced to walk under the sun to check up on people. So it's not really a, a good situation for her. And this is a photo of a nurse from the US who was visiting the Philippines when the lockdown happened. So as you can see, if you, if I, play together. This is a Philippine nurse. This is a nurse from the U.S. who's a, supposed to be a patient, but she's wearing a medical grade N95. Meanwhile, her nurse who is looking after her is wearing a cloth mask. So you can see the disparity between um, nurses abroad and nurses here in the Philippines who are not given the proper protections. And this is when they're checking up on her. So every day they, when a person is put under quarantine, every day these nurses needs to go there in their house to check up on them, like check their temperatures, ask them for signs until, until they graduate from the quarantine. Uh, as of now, we're uh, way back, this is March, uh, they're quarantining people by putting them inside their homes because we don't have isolation area yet during that time. This is April with uh, her son, Johan, a five-year-old. So I think one of the biggest uh, worry that April have, and I, I think everyone else who are frontliners is bringing the virus home. So every day when April goes back home because she, they did not give them a place to stay, she needs to change. She needs to make sure that she takes a bath, um, disinfect herself before she can even hug his son who always asks her, why can't I hug you? I mean, a five-year-old cannot understand the reason why parents cannot hug them. But with this time, I think it's for April, it's one of the most painful part of working and worrying about bringing home the, the virus. And in this photo, we have Rosalie, another nurse who's checking up on a suspected case of COVID. And as you can see, she's wearing a a cloth mask, it's cute, but it's not enough. And then these are um, our Burundi healthcare workers. This woman, Rosalie is sharing a, a bottle of alcohol. So because of the lack of alcohols, everyone is sharing what they have. And this woman wearing a handkerchief is a Burundi healthcare worker who is also going together with the nurses to check up on possible cases. And this is Rosalie on her way back home. You can see how tired she is and she's at the back of the truck. So uh, these women that I mentioned are actually working under the Department of Health under 
a contract, a contract which means they don't have a job security. We see them all the time as heroes, but because the go they don't have, the government is not hiring regular workers, a lot of these nurses ends up working as contractual. So with Rosalie, she have a contract of every six months, which means she need to renew every six months and her there's no job security. She's getting paid 500 pesos a day to work under these circumstances. And also the hazard pay is very low. I think it's a thousand pesos a month. And then aside from no protection, they also need to work as volunteers for a couple of years before even getting a job order from the, from the Department of Health. So it, it, it's a very controversial issue. I spoke to the to a representative of Nurses Association and they were they shared to me that the practice of volunteerism was stopped but still a lot of people are are going under it through another name. So it's, they just changed the name of volunteerism. Volunteerism means they work like a regular nurse with no pay so that they can get experience and so that they can go abroad. And this is Annalisa. She's been a nurse, the head nurse of our rural health unit. She's been a nurse for 23 years and she only got promoted to a regular nurse last year. So can you imagine working 20 years under a contract and not being regular and getting the benefits of a regu regular employee? Because she's gonna go and check a, the husband of a COVID-19 patient in the hospital, she needs to wear a better protection. So they have a, she have a mask, a better mask, but then she have reused it for like quite a few times. And then the, the face shield that she's wearing is not a medical face shield, but it's a face shield used by construction workers to protect themselves. And uh, this is how they do it every day. They go house to house. And I, I chose to show this photo because of the dog. You know, it's not easy to go house to house in rural areas. Everyone have dogs. I, I don't even like it. But these are one of the dangers that they need to go through. And a nurse lady wearing her mask that she had been using since the lockdown started. So what she does every day is she stuffs tissue um, under the cloth mask to add more protection and also she started sleeping at the clinic because she she's scared that she'll bring the virus home to her mother who's at the high risk air, um who is a high risk and all and also one of their jobs is they're being stationed to a lot of areas where there's checkpoints so aside from going house to house to check on possible patients aside from doing their regular jobs of making sure that people are doing vaccination or getting vaccinated or disseminating information, they still need to go on duty on checkpoints to check up temperatures of travelers. So one of the things that they're trying to, uh, hard to do right now is encouraging people to immunize their children because of the virus not people are not keen on getting their kids vaccinated. So they're trying to combat that because they don't want to have another um, pandemic in the near future, like, you know, like t tuberculosis or whatever that they need to get people get vaccinated from. So a lot of these people are, are working under, I, I call it zero benefits because it's true. <laughs> for, for my part, it's true. I mean, working and risking your life for 300 to 500 pesos a day is not enough. And um, I, I spoke to a lot of them and the dream is going abroad to work. And we all know that the government is trying to stop our healthcare workers from leaving because we need them. It's true, we need them. But, it, but let's put ourselves into their shoes where you're being sent out outside to combat a pandemic with no benefit or with less benefits than a, a construction worker, will you go and risk your life? So this, I spoke to a lot of them and the dream was to go abroad. And I'm, I'm hoping that in the near future, we take care of our healthcare workers because they are the ones who are actually working hard for us not to get the virus, you know? And um, I wanna speak about the impact of this project as well. So when I did this story, 
aside from from the trolls or the not so nice comments that I received, the beauty of this story was that people read about it and they started sending surgical masks to our nurses here in the province, and which, which was a little bit difficult with the with the logistics because you know, like we're so far from an airport. But then because of this story, they were able to get some donations so that they can have at least a PPE to check on isolated patients or they have surgical masks to use when they're going out and checking up on people. So that is the impact of this story. And then um, these people keep saying it's, they are ready, but they are not well equipped to to battle this pandemic so they're begging people to stay home because if they don't stay home they we, we will not they will not be able to flatten the curve which means our hospital will collapse i i don't think our province have our own testing areas so we still need to send it to manila and then um aside from working under desperate conditions or the lack of personal equipment, it's the, it's the death of medical workers in the Philippines that worries them. I, I, we have the highest in Asia right now, in ASEAN countries. So we have the highest number of medical personals who are dying because of the virus, which kind of like makes sense if we are sending them without proper protections, no? So when the government announced the lockdown, Unfortunately for these people, there's no bonuses for them that was announced. So they're, they are working out of duty and out of love of, for their communities. So with Dr. Cortez, um, who, is still, who, who is still running the, uh, um, our area, he's really grateful because until now we, we have zero cases. So our other towns have like cases of COVID-19, but in our town, we have zero cases. The reason for this is he started contact tracing in February, even before, even before it was announced that there will be a lockdown. So he started contact tracing by using the, you, you know, in, in, every, in every rural area, so we have chismosas or the, the, what do you call that in English? The gossipers. So they actually ask the chismosas of every village to report to them who comes in in, the, in our town. So everyone who comes in are forced into quarantine, whether they went to an area, whether they came from Manila, from abroad, or from any places with a positive case. He started doing the contact tracing by uh, co communicating with the community that you need to report people who comes in in town so that we can trace if we have a positive case. But then for him, we don't have a testing kit. So we don't know if we don't really have cases or we just don't know about it. But what he did was treated everyone in our town, 53,000 people as asymptomatic. And they started that last February. So I, I, I'm really awed by these amazing steps that the rural community have done to make sure that our town is protected from the virus. And I'm hoping that it will continue. And then um, with April, who has been walking a lot of miles every day, she got offered bicycles and, and people started offering her if they can drive her around to her duties. So that's one amazing news. She's still working as a midwife in a contractual basis, but hoping that next year she'll get promoted to a regular uh, midwife for, for, for her village. And uh, fortunately, she's not a positive. So after quarantining for 14 days, she needs to go back to the United States and work as a nurse. So she's also a frontliner who became a patient when she came back home. And of course, these nurses, I'm still in contact with them. They're still doing the same thing. They're still contract, contact tracing. But fortunately, they stopped going to checkpoints. And they finally got um, the proper thermometers to use. Because when I first photographed them, when the lockdown was announced, they are using auxiliary thermometers for every patient, which is very risky because it can lead to, to uh, contamination. And of course, um, 
these nurses are still called our the unseen frontliners but hopefully with the stories like this we can we can finally see their sacrifices you know like i, I know we've been bom bombarded with with images of nurses work, working or in peaks and all these are the nurses in rural areas that we don't usually see because well it's far away from the city so i hopefully we keep seeing them and we keep um aside from clapping for them we encourage our government to take care of them as well so that's my presentation is it to pass okay so if you have any questions you can just i think bombino will will Put it together yeah if, thank you thank you for that Siza how many days did you spend photographing um, the, the frontliners so I, I'm always on assignment so with this story I think I spent weeks with them but uh, after finishing it I went back to 14 days quarantine and then I got another assignment in Manila so I was there for like a week and went back again to do a 14 days quarantine, which is quite difficult for my side as well, because it means I'm losing work or I'm not being, I cannot go out. But I, I do think that it's the proper thing to do because I don't want to be asymptomatic and, you know, like giving away the virus to everyone. So it took me weeks to do this and um, I'm still doing another story with them with another publication. So I'm going to go back again on the field. I'm actually in the field right now. So, yeah. And this first story came out where the the ones of the the frontliners in your town. So this story is funded by the Pulitzer Center. So and then it came out first uh, at the in CNN International and then the Nation. So you know, I'm so happy about this because it's it's very rare that you, that a small town can be highlighted you know like you can put a spotlight to a very small town because all the news are coming out from cities and then suddenly a small town in in the philippines is being spot you know put in the spotlight so i'm very happy about this story and sad as well so it's a lot of emotions like every day i'm angry <laughs> because you see them really working hard and you know what i'm also embarrassed whenever i'm with them because i'm wearing proper protection. I have N95, I'm wearing goggles. I, I have all the protections that I need, but I'm seeing them working in contact with these people wearing a cloth mask and I feel embarrassed and I'm apologizing to them that I'm really sorry. If I have extras, I'll give it to you, but I don't, well, even me, I don't have extras. So it, it's kind of like a big, it, it, it's such a big uh, emotional roller coaster every time I go out, you know? Okay, does anyone have questions? Um, just, do you want to type it in uh, as a chat or raise your hands? I can't see any hands raised. I can't see any hands raised. Well, it must be good. <laughs> anyway. Do you have anything to ask, Siza? No, I, I do think that how many people have been diagnosed in the province? So I'm seeing a question. Uh, okay, I have a question from Kara Wilson. Um, you remember when we did the Harvard talk last year in Manila House, right? Yeah, uh, I remember Kara. Yeah. Kara's asking what your next project is. Well, I'm working on it a big project that will be out soon. I'm under NDA, so sorry guys. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm working on a big project. It's still very much connected with COVID-19, but um, working on these storage, stories which are more digging deeper, more than the virus itself. I do think that we have that virus you just get tired, you know, like reading all the time about oh, COVID, 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 like the world's still running, you know? <laughs> Even with, with, with the virus, there's still things that are happening around us that are now buried, on the, on, uh, buried under COVID-19 news. So right now I'm working on a story for CNN again about migration. And then I'm working on another story with not, with, I don't know if it's going to push through National Geographic, but it's more like human interest stories, something deeper than and goes beyond the virus. 
Okay, and then I have a question from Joy Alampai, who is with Asia Society. Um, she's asking, after the photo documentary and the written articles, are there plans to produce a video documentary on the plight for frontliners? I'm, I actually want to produce a, um, I, I already posted about this, a children's book hmm. about COVID-19 because I, I do think that the children's, you know, the young ones are the ones who, who, who will inherit all of this, you know, like being born at this time. So I, I have this experience with my nieces that it's difficult to explain to them why they can't go out. It's, dif it's difficult for them to, to understand what COVID-19 is. So how do we explain to kids in a, in, a, in a way that they will understand better what is this pandemic that we are going through? Like how, how can they participate in a way that, that, they, that they feel that they're doing something good for their families? Like with my nieces, I literally like scared them. Like if you go out, your grandfather will die. I do think that's a bad thing, but then the kids stayed home, but the kids stayed home because I was talking to them like adults, you know? So I, I, wanna do a, I want to do a children's book about this for, for kids to understand that the world they were born into and the world they're going out to will be different. You, you know, it's like the, the, this is a huge uh, pivotal moment for the whole world of like, before you go out without a mask, you can hang out with your friends, you can hug your, you know, even just the simple act of hugging is such a luxury nowadays. You can't even hug children, you know? So that, that's what's on my mind right now. And I want to work on that. And Joyce asking about video. Yeah, of course. I want to, I want to, I want to produce a, a video about this, but as of now, I'm focusing on photography more. Um, I have a question, another question from Kara. What is the DOH official stance about the lack of PPEs for frontliners, both in hospitals and in the field? Do, you, do they just keep saying they have no budget? And what, what else can we do to help? So when I did this reporting, uh, in the name of fairness, I emailed Department of Health to ask for their opinions. like. Like, uh, is it true that you're sending, you know, our nurses without proper protections? And fortunately, they responded. They said that they ordered PPEs. Like, I, I do think that they, I don't know if the figure is right, but it's like 1 billion pesos. They spend 1 billion pesos to, to buy personal protection for our healthcare workers. But then we don't, you know, like it's April, we don't know, we haven't received any. So I'm not sure where are those PPEs, <laughs> but there was an announcement that they did order PPEs. And, and I think one thing that, well, it's, it, it irritated me a little bit when I received that response, the text message was, well, even countries abroad don't have PPEs. Y you know that, like the, that reasoning that- He said to you? Yeah. Like, it's okay because even countries, you know, you know, like, it's not only happening to us, it's happening around the world. And for me, I'm like, well, that's not a good reason. You know, like, just because it's happening there, or, I don't know, I, I got irritated a bit, but I understand after. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of issues here that with the government that needs to be unlocked. I, I don't understand, like, I was just reading it today about, the testing kits. So Phil Health will be paying for the testing kits 8,000 pesos each when it actually costs 4,000. So there's like a lot of like disconnects and I'm like, I don't understand this. So, so I'm trying to understand it as well, how the government is working. But I, I do think that they're doing their best. I mean, everyone was like, you know, like bamboozled by this virus. Suddenly it came and no one is prepared. And I do think that they're doing what they can. But I'm, I was hoping that after this pandemic, if we all survive this, they will prioritize our healthcare. They will prioritize our healthcare workers and they will prioritize them that they don't need to leave the country. You know, like it, 
if you look at the news abroad, it's actually Asian medical workers who are like dying because of it. Because, you know, they love what they do. They love serving. And, and now they're, they're the ones who are like dying. It's just scary. Like if doctors are dying in the Philippines, then me, an ordinary person can die too. So th that is not a good, opti optic wise, it's not good for the government because how can we trust our medical system when our doctors are dying? Because the government that did not give them proper protection. Mm. Wow. Um, can you see that? What are the challenges of reporting on this story besides health safety? And how did you overcome them? This is a question from Jian. Well, the challenges for me, aside from the health safety, was but it, it's the unknown, you know? We don't see the enemy, so it's the unknown, the uncertainty of this. So I, I reported in, in areas that I don't even speak the language. I went to conflict zones. I went, it, it, it's difficult. The, the logistics, the preparation is really different. I need to make sure that that the area I'm going I'm going to is an open space. I need to change the way I use a camera. I'm I'm basically risking all my gears right now because I could be spraying <laughs> alcohols into it, and, and you know like gears alcohols are not good. Uh, like it's not a good combo. And of course the challenges is how do we rep how do I report this without without no how do I report this objectively in a way that my emotions doesn't, does not, you know, does not drive the, the conversation. So I stick with the journalism ethics. And, and again, I think it's the lack of protection itself that is really hard for me as well, because I'm buying my, my own PPEs from, from Hong Kong. So, uh, you know, it, it's just that you, I can't buy it here in the Philippines, so I need to order it from abroad. So that is one difficulty of reporting and changing the whole mindset and logistics of being a reporter. But I also wanted to ask, as, as a photographer, when you were doing these photos, were you also do the same, um, what do you call them? Like, were you also looking, how did you compose the photos? Did that come in? The kind of artistic side or the craft side of photography? Did that come into, you know, it, it, did you look at the composition, the colors, the, or it was just instinctive already? I think it's instinctive already because I've been doing it like, I've been doing it every day. Like even though I'm inside the house, I'm like taking photos. So I think it came out in, instinctively because if I'm still thinking about the composition, then I'll forget get the security part. So I really need to, to to focus on on making sure that we're all safe rather than thinking about the composition side. I'm, I'm quite lucky that it's now a reflex rather than still thinking about it, you know? And yeah, uh, one of the challenges too is dry skin. <laughs> it's just hard because every time you go back home, you need to shower, you need to, I need to run immediately to the bathroom, I need to leave everything outside, and then I, I kept a safe distance to my family until now, like, well, the kids, it's difficult for the kids, really, to be honest, it's so difficult for the kids to, to say, you can't hug me, you know, you, you, sh you should stay away, you know, it's difficult for them to understand, like, their instinct is to, to show love, you know, but then you, if you tell them, no, you can't hug me, they, they, you can see the, the, the rejection on their face. And I think that's one of the most difficult part. It's a very good question here from Rain. Um, I'm, she's curious to know when you're sent out to assignments like this, what mental and creative preparations do you do so you can fully grasp the situation and scenario so you can tell a great story at the end? That's kind of what you just talked about but maybe you can elaborate a bit more in your process well i do think that the with the mental um preparation again as i've mentioned it's a very tricky assignments with the mental preparations i don't know should i mention this but this pandemic made me fucking religious i'm sorry <laughs> it's like i started praying more because i realized that i think that faith part it, it kind of gave me a little bit of boost of confidence like okay i know that i will not i will go out and i will not get the virus because 
someone is looking after me. So I need to have that, that, that mental um, preparation. And then of course, with the creative part, it's about the research. It's all about the research because, you know, an empty, an empty, uh, an empty brain is a blind eye. I cannot just go out and take photographs when I know nothing about this issue. Yes, it can be something that is uh, visually appealing, but what is the context of the photo? When you know more, when you do research, when you read, when you, when you um, learn about these people, you, you, it's like putting data in your brain and within these data, it will come out visually. So the research part is really important and I think it's, it, it takes more time than the photographing part. Maybe it's like 60% of research, 40% of going out. And, and um, that's the only preparation that I did. And of course, read about the virus, read about transmission so that I know what not to touch, what to do, and how does it get transmitted. I once slept in a car for six to seven hours wearing PPEs. It was so difficult. <laughs> I was I was going to Manila and it, because it was an enclosed car and I do not know the driver so I we're not leaving together I do not know the driver it's a stranger so my decision was should I take it off so I'll be more comfortable or should I not so I decided that I need to sleep with with the PPE and I'm like okay I, I survived this then maybe I can do airplanes <laughs> the next time let's do 16 hours but one of those things I think it's reading about the virus, educating yourself about it will be a good um, preparation when you decide to go out and take photographs. And always remember to be mindful. I think this one, the, the, the pandemic taught us that it's not about, you know, like as Governor Cuomo had said, it's not you, it's we, you know? So it's not me, it's not you, it's we. So it's more into, Always think about the other people. You might not be sick, you might not feel anything, but you might be healthy or you think you can go through a virus and survive, but what about the other people you're gonna encounter? So always think about them, the mindfulness about your actions. So when I think about, I considered myself asymptomatic from the start so that I will be mindful of my actions towards other people. I think that helps a lot with the mental preparation. Yeah. But so your community there in Bambang, is it under GCQ now? Because you said there are no, no cases, right? So uh, the surrounding towns, we have cases. So our town is a catch basin of, of people from other towns. We're, we're like Bhutan, like flat, and then everything is surrounded by other towns. So our town has zero case, and the other towns have their cases, except us, So which is, ama which is an amazing feat. But um, I do think that, that what happened when uh, the first COVID patient happened uh, in the province, the, the patient died. And I think it scared people because that was the first positive patient and he died. And um, I'm really sorry, uh, you know, like it, it's such a sad story, but it also scared people because it's not like, oh my God, someone is someone get the virus and they survive. It's like someone get the virus, they died. So everyone's like, this is serious. So no one's going out, everyone's wearing a mask. So I think it's more like the discipline, yeah. Okay. Um, are we, do we have any more questions? I also wanted to ask you, you said your mother, right? I mean, I think everybody's familiar with Saiza's story, even the ones who joined this late, that her mother was a migrant worker in Hong Kong, a domestic helper, and Saiza followed in her footsteps. So you're back here, but your mother is still in Hong Kong, right? She's still a domestic worker. Yeah. And how, how is she? Is she safe? Is she, is she, is she with, living with her employers? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not worried about her, actually. I, I'm, I'm more worried about my father here because in Hong Kong, everyone's just wearing a mask and they don't have, they have like zero local transmission this past couple of weeks and she's staying home with Mrs. Louis. So I'm not that worried about her because they have a very strong healthcare system. You know, so I think that trust with their healthcare system made me a little bit, real, you know, like 
at least I'm not worried about her, but I'm worried about my dad here. So she's fine. She's okay. She's supposed to come home. I think one of the things that, how it affected us was she's supposed to come home this April. She have not seen our family for like two years now, one and a half year. So she have not seen my father, my nieces, my, you know, and because of the COVID pandemic, she's not able to come back and and see the family. So I think that's the one thing that affected her greatly. Like, uh, especially, you know, she was like, I'm not sure when I'm a, when this is over. I really want to go back home. And she was, th- she was actually thinking of returning to the Philippines yeah. indefinitely. She's like, I do think that this pandemic is a sign that I need to go back home and take care of your father. I'm like, yeah, it's up to you, you know. So it, that's how it affected her. But I'm more happy that she's there, actually. How long has she been away from working? Uh Right now, it's 24 years, 26, 26. I think so, 26, yeah. That's a long time, yeah. Yeah, so do we have any more questions? I think we have one. How many people have been diagnosed in the province from Sandra? I'm not sure over the number, but they were saying that we have zero cases now. But we have, um, as because our town considered everyone to be possible suspects, everyone who comes in are considered asymptomatic until they finish 14 days or they get a test. So if you look at the statistics or the numbers, our town have the highest number of persons under monitoring. Like everyone was shocked, like, wow, you have 600? And I'm like, well, these 600 people came. It, it's... it's in our town, it's easy to leave. Returning, it's impossible. It's so difficult. Like you need to get tested. You need to get all of this. I think one good step that our LGU have done was they allowed the doctor to run our, our department for the, the pandemic. Because our mayor was like, what do I know about health? Let the doctor run, run the program so that he, you know, so I think that's really a good um, a good uh, initiative from our local government. So we still we have zero cases until now. Can you repeat how, how you told us earlier what the population was of your town? How, how many people? Oh, it's fifty six thousand. So it's a small, but you know, it's a town. It's not a province. So you said there's only one community doctor, one public doctor there. Yeah. What are the health facilities like? Well, the health facilities, we have one provincial hospital, which, um, and then we, we have one rural health unit. So in our town, so that's our, that's the medical facilities that are ab- available. We don't have a testing area. We still need to send it to Manila once you get tested. What worries me right now is the number of people dying of stroke which is, is scary because they're not getting tested after they died, you know, like, and for me, I'm like, well, stroke is a sign of, you know, it, it's happening in the U.S. and they were saying that people who are positive are dying of stroke. So because we don't have a te- uh, test kits, we don't have testing kits, I think they decided that everyone who dies, uh, COVID or not, they don't allow them to have a funeral just yeah. to make sure that everyone is safe because they don't test them after they died. So I think that's one of the worries that I'm, I'm trying to, to, you know, I'm trying to understand. And one thing is tuberculosis. I found out that 75, 75, the minimum of people dying from tuberculosis in the Philippines is 75. That's a lot of people in one day. So aside from this COVID-19, we have another thing that is happening that is not being seen right now because we are consumed by this pandemic. So I'm thinking, Saiza, can you show your presentation again as a slideshow? And then maybe while you're showing it, you can tell us about um, which one you like, which is your favorite shot and why. So I think some people weren't able to see everything, but maybe we can do it as a slideshow. So these are masks. This is our only doctor. We, we have a joke that we should like give him like an astronaut protection because he's the only one. 
And th- this is my favorite shot, actually. This is a public market. And even though there's a lockdown, because a uh, public market is an essential area, it was not closed. So you can see her, it was well composed, aside from the composition, you can see the frustration on her face, the, you know, that emotions of being tired and not knowing what to do. This is one of my favorite shots uh, uh, within the whole um, assignment, of course. And this one, this is, the light is fantastic, I think. Yeah. Because, yeah, it was really good light. I like this one too. It's, it's a moment of tenderness. So yeah, my favorite shot was the, the photograph of April. Do you all see it? Yeah. And how, um, I have a question from Christelle. Have you always felt welcome when you were photographing by the people and the authorities? So this is your town though, no? So everybody, everybody knows you. Well, I've been away for too long that they don't actually know me. <laughs> Some of them, like, like they've read about me, but they haven't really seen me. So uh, there's no difficulty with, with in our town. I think that's one of the advantage of telling the story in your own backyard. So everyone's welcoming. Uh, with authorities, I think I experienced that in Manila. Like I have a yelling match with a police officer because they were, tr- they were trying to, to do the, the testing, the thermometer and they were so close like really close and I'm like what are you doing distance amigo and then it's like they were like well we were doing your job yeah but you're not doing it properly you know like you might be asymptomatic and giving it to me by then that's just it you know but uh I think it's more like telling people that you need to wear your mask like I started telling people that I will not even talk to you if you're not wearing masks I'm sorry but this is for for both of us so those are just the difficulties, yeah. Then Lulette has a question. Why is it that everyone in your town is not vaccinated with anti-TB vaccine? This is the BCG, right? The BCG vaccine? I, I just found out myself that I don't have a measles vaccine. Oh, no. I, I was like, oh, my God. God must really love me. I survived 33 years. I, I don't know. I do think that because of, of a systematic failure of giving vaccinations, my mom was like, well, I, I remember I, I got you vaccinated, but I don't know what it is. And then because I need to go back to school and school is asking for my immunization records. So they, they found my records and I only have two vaccinations. And I'm like, wow, I survived 33 years. So I'm now completing when you my went back to, to When you went to New York to the dish. Yeah. Um, NYU. No, I'm going back again. No, but I, I'm, 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 your records for your immunization records, and you only had two, two shots. That's when you found out. Uh, I I thought I don't know what happened back then when I went back, but I have a um. I do think they g- gave me a booster or something something. I, I I don't know what happened, but I found out again today that you only have two on your system. You need to get the measles. You need to get the other vaccination, and then. I, I tried finding out the midwife who was giving free vaccinations back then. And, and she was like, well, we don't have it back then. So you can get it now. So I'm getting it now. <laughs> it's weird. So I, I don't know why a lot of people are not getting vaccinated. Maybe because of belief. Maybe because it's so far away from, we only have one community center. So it's really far from them. They need to walk miles just to go there. So probably that's one of the few reasons. We have a lot of reasons. And, and COVID-19 added to one of those reasons. Like, why would they risk their children being exposed to a, a nurse or a hospital setting? Like, oh, I forgot to tell this. One of the biggest um, struggle of the nurses who goes house to house is when people harass them. Like, why are you coming over here? You're bringing us the virus. What? So they... 
yeah so they're being har- harassed I, I because i don't uh, i i think the people don't, don't understand what they're doing so they're being harassed that that uh, uh they're being accused of bringing the virus to communities instead of you know thanking them for the things that they've been doing for the community how do you get to your town let's say if you're coming from manila how do you travel to your town I um they usually pick me up at the airport so it's by car. Uh it's by car only or bus or something. But if someone, you know, were just to wanted to go there, how would because it's a small it's a small village, right? Small town. So Yeah, it's uh we're on the national highway, so ah. you can just yeah, it's like a catch basin. It's a small town but it's a catch basin of like the whole province, like everyone goes there because we have the Jolly we have the fast food. <laughs> we we have everything except Starbucks, which is sad. <laughs> I miss my coffee. <laughs> okay, I think are there any more questions? I think we have a few more minutes if you have questions. Otherwise, um, can I say thank you to Saiza for spending your afternoon with us, for telling us about your experiences. You're wonderful. Uh, We learned so much. And also, just sorry, shameless plug, uh, Manila House has an initiative, a feeding initiative also for um, frontliners, which we call Hot Meals for Heroes. So you can donate to... um, you can donate to Manila House and we will deliver the meals to the frontliners. We've partnered with the USD College of Nursing. So actually it goes to the nurses first and then the doctors and all that. And we've worked with over 12 different hospitals all over Metro Manila. So, Amazing. you know, just let me know if you'd like to help, if you'd like to be a part of this. Again, thank you so much, Saiza. That was great. And, and yeah. we wish you the best of luck and we can't wait to see your, your next project. Thank you so much, you guys, for having me. Thank you, Bambina. Thank you, everyone who joined us. I hope um, I you learned something from a provinciana. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I hope we do this again next time. Thank you for the space. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.